pray and we invite you, Lord, to speak to each one of us according to their desire, according to the, the need of their heart. But more so, Lord God, according to what you would like us to partake of, according to what you would like to change and impact and transform in our lives. We pray that the word will do its work in us. The word heals, the word saves, the word sets free, the word empowers, the word encourages, the word transforms, the word cleanses, the word sanctifies. We pray that the word will do its work. Your word says the word is sharper than a two-edged sword. It discerns thoughts, it separates bone and marrow. Lord, we pray that the word will come and do exactly that in the lives of everybody that is listening to me tonight. Thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we do pray. Amen. Today, I am looking at a very familiar story. I'm looking at a very familiar text. It is the text in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. I have called it today's message, Beyond the Tree, Beyond the Sycamore Fig Tree. I'll read from the word. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed the sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this man and began to mutter, he has gone to, to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the, the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Many times when we look at the story of Zacchaeus, people focus on the fact that a short man climbed a tree and they stop at that. A short man climbed a tree. It is not very rare to find short men climbing trees. It is not very rare to find people climbing trees. But there's something significant about this story when I was reading through it last week that impacted me and made me feel there are things in here that I could share, thoughts, ideas that I could share with my listeners as you listen to me tonight. To appreciate the importance of this story, one has to look beyond the tree. Let's look at the city of Jericho. I was looking at the city of Jericho. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem and he comes to the city of Jericho. And Jesus decides he's not going to stop in the city of Jericho. The Bible says he was passing by. He was having nothing to do with Jericho. He wanted to leave Jericho behind him and move to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is where his mission was. Jerusalem is where his destiny was. Jerusalem is the place he wanted to go. The city of Jericho was the first city that the children of Israel conquered when they were led by Joshua after they crossed the Jordan. In Joshua chapter 6, we see the story of the city of Jericho. And the city of Jericho 
was a very important trade city. It was in Jericho that Balak was asked by, or Balak asked Balaam to curse the children of Israel as documented in the book of Numbers chapter 22. The coming of Jesus was prophesied in Jericho. Balaam, when he was taken to go and cast the children of Israel, he prophesied the coming of Jesus in Jericho. In the book of Numbers chapter 24, verses 15 to 19, this is what the Bible says. Numbers 24, 15 to 19. Then Balaam spoke his message. The prophecy of Balaam, son of Beor, the prophet of one of whose eyes sees clearly, the prophet of one who hears the words of God, who has knowledge from the Most High, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who falls prostrate and whose eyes are opened. And then he begins the prophecy on Jesus in verse 17. I see him. But not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab, the skulls of all the people of Sheth. Jesus is prophesied and talked about in the city of Jericho. Jericho is where the commander of the army of the Lord met Joshua. In the book of Joshua, chapter five, verse 13 to 15. That's where the commander of the army of, of, of the Lord came to Joshua and Joshua asked him, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And the commander of the army of the Lord said to him, neither. Jericho was not an ordinary city. Jericho is the city that the Lord himself overthrew. The children of Israel did not lift a spear or a sword in the city of Jericho. The Lord himself overthrew the city of Jericho for them. All that the children of Israel had to do was to worship. Jericho teaches us something. When we worship, the Lord will come. The Lord will meet us. The Lord will act on our behalf. When we worship the Lord, the Lord takes over. When we honor him, the Lord takes over. When we lift up our voices to praise him, the Lord takes over. He says in Psalms 108 verses 12 and 13, he says he'll give us victory over our, our, our enemies. He says with the Lord, we shall gain the victory. All we need to do is worship the Lord, and the Lord takes over. Jericho is where the Lord first proved to Israel that he would be with Joshua as he was with Moses. In the book of Joshua, chapter 6, verse 27, the Lord spoke and reassured Joshua and the children of Israel that in the same way that he had been with Moses, he was going to be with, jo with Joshua. So jo Jericho, is a very important city. Two more observations that I made about the city of Jericho and then I move on. Jericho is where Rahab, the prostitute, entered the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Jericho is where Rahab, a prostitute, entered the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, brethren, if Rahab entered the genealogy of Jesus Christ, then you and I have hope because the Lord is looking for his seed that he has put in your heart. The Lord looked out for Rahab. The Lord searched out for Rahab because Rahab was able to embrace the children of Israel and the word of God and the fear of God in, in her heart. The Lord worked out salvation in the life of Rahab. Joshua chapter 6, verse 25, Rahab enters the genealogy of Jesus Christ. 
Jericho is the city which Jesus cast, which Joshua cast, not Jesus, which Joshua cast. The city of Jericho was cast by Joshua. After it fell, after the Lord conquered it, after it was crushed, Joshua pronounced a curse and he said, whoever builds the city of Jericho will do so at the expense of his first child. And if he goes ahead and places gates into the city, he will do so at the expense of his second son. And that was fulfilled in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 34. A man by the names of Hill rebuilt the city during the days of King Ahab, but he did so at the expense of his two sons so that the word of the Lord could be fulfilled almost 500 years later. And the word of God was fulfilled. So it is in this city, it is in this setting that the Lord Jesus Christ comes and he is going to pass. Why was Jesus passing Jericho without wanting to preach there? Why did then Jesus want to do anything in Jericho? And yet Jericho was such a central city. It had so much significance, spiritually, economically, socially, and otherwise. And we see here, I have mentioned it to you. Number one, the Lord himself conquered the city of Jericho. The army, the commander of the armies of the Lord met Joshua in Jericho. The Lord came and spoke and confirmed Joshua in Jericho. So the Lord had already been at work in Jericho. Rahab is uh, saved in Jericho and she enters the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Jericho. The Lord is at work. The Lord has been at work. The Lord has already been doing something in the city of Jericho. And that is where we encounter yet another person whom the Bible describes as a sinner, the man Zacchaeus. The man Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Tax collectors were hated and unwanted. And maybe as I speak, I'm speaking to somebody who feels hated. Maybe I'm speaking to somebody who feels unwanted. Maybe I'm speaking to somebody who does not believe that they even have value. Maybe I'm speaking to somebody who feels in their heart or in their life like they are, they're like they're Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was seen as working for the oppressor Rome. So he was seen as a traitor, somebody who was betraying his people, Israel. Tax collectors were seen as cheats because even when John the Baptist comes to preach, he says to them, do not collect more than you are supposed to collect from the people. So they were, they were unwanted, they were hated. Zacchaeus had a past that was better forgotten than remembered. I believe that each person listening to me tonight, we all have a past that we are not happy and keen to associate with. There are people, when they see somebody who knows them from their past, they freak out because they think, oh my God, this person is going to betray me, he's going to speak whatever pertained to my past. But at the same time, this unwanted man, this hated man was wealthy. So despite being wealthy, Zacchaeus had a void. Zacchaeus was wealthy, but not fulfilled. Many of us today are pursuing resources and riches and money and wealth and prosperity. And people have dwelt on prosperity to the extent of believing that once they get rich, their void will be fulfilled. During this COVID pandemic, there are many millionaires that have committed suicide. Well, because maybe their empire crumbled by just a few million dollars. Despite having billions, they still went on to commit suicide, even though they had million, uh, uh, millions of dollars. They felt like their world was crumbling. There are many people who have the wealth, but at the same time, they may have the void. There's nothing wrong with being rich. There's nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with being prosperous. 
there's nothing wrong with owning property. But even as you seek and desire to own these things, you need to realize that they do not fill the void. The real person that fills the void is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. It's interesting that the Bible says he wanted to see who Jesus was. Zacchaeus did not desire to see what Jesus can do or what Jesus was doing or what Jesus could do. Today, many of us are so focused on what Jesus can do or is doing or is not doing to the extent that if we believe he's not doing what we want him to do, then we can reach the extent of forsaking him or abandoning him. And many people have forsaken the Lord Jesus Christ. Many people have abandoned the Lord Jesus Christ because they were busy trying to understand what he is doing or what he's not doing and not focusing on him. My prayer, my desire for you, my brother and sister, if you are listening to me, be like Zacchaeus. Rather than seeking to see what Jesus is doing or is not doing or can do or is not doing, you desire to see Jesus himself. Zacchaeus' desire was on Jesus himself. He wanted to see what Jesus was. There was a desire in him and a good desire which God honored. When you have a good desire, God will honor it. That's why the Bible says God will give you the desires of your heart. God will give you the desires of your heart. In other words, God will give you desires. And then he, when, once he gives you the desires, he will go ahead to fulfill those desires. If they are godly desires, if they honor God. My question to you tonight is, what desires consume your heart? What consumes you? What eats you up? What grips you? What keeps you awake at night? Do you stay awake praying, crying to God for people's salvation? Or do you only stay awake praying, crying to God to become richer and more wealthy? What consumes your heart? What consumes you? The Bible says, delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Psalms 37. Zacchaeus was short. <laughs> Zacchaeus was a short man. Rich, but short. Rich, but unwanted. Rich, but rejected. He was short. He had a limitation. What limitation do you have? We all have limitations. We all have things that make us short. We all have things that make us not measure up. When put against other people, we all have limitations. But what did Zacchaeus do with his limitation? One of the important things is that Zacchaeus was aware of his limitation. And this is the challenge for most people. Many people are not aware of their limitations. It reminds me one time when I first went for an interview and they asked me, I think it was my first or second interview in life. I was still a young man, fresh from university. And the interviewer, the first question the interviewer asked me was, what are your weaknesses? And I looked at him and I said, me having weaknesses? I don't have any weaknesses. <laughs> but the more I have grown in leadership, the more I have grown in management, the more I have grown in life, the more I have realized that probably I have more weaknesses than strengths. But it is being aware of those weaknesses that helps me. So one of the important things is what we call self-awareness. There are many people who lack self-awareness. Every time they think of something that may make them look like weak, they want to dismiss it and run away from it. But we need self-awareness. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, do not think of yourself more highly than you should. But trust me, most people in the world, if not all, think of themselves more highly than they should all the time, not some of the time, even in the church. Even when we say, oh, I'm being humble, I'm a servant of the Lord, many times we are thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought. 
But we need to be aware of our limitations. We need to be judges of ourselves, to introspect, to look inside, identify those limitations. But rather than let those limitations hold you back, do something about it. Zacchaeus knew his weakness, but rather than let his limitation hold him back, he walked around it. He walked around it. He walked around it by climbing a tree. The Ficus scamorus, a fig tree. What does this teach us? Zacchaeus was strategic. We need to be strategic in our dealings with people. We need to be strategic as we go through life. We need to be strategic as we make decisions. We need to be strategic as we interface with life. We need to be strategic. The times have changed. COVID has changed the world. There are many people who are crying for the world, the pre-COVID world. I can almost tell you, the pre-COVID world will never come back. We have entered the new world. We have entered the world where we are not very sure when schools will ever open at full bloom again. Even places of worship, even many people who would have come to the places of worship, some will just be scared. They would rather stay at home than come to be part of a congregation where they might get an infection or something like that. Business today in the United States of America, during this COVID uh, challenge, over 2,000 major stores, 2,000 major, not just stores, but companies are closing shop, are closing down. Big names like Payless, big names are closing down. Sears and others, and even those which are not closing down completely, they are closing down hundreds and thousands of their stores. Millions of people are losing their jobs. We need to become more strategic. How do we live and work in a post-COVID world or in a COVID-infested world? Zacchaeus was strategic. He was visionary. Zacchaeus did his geography. He mapped out where Jesus was going to pass. He calculated. He said, if Jesus is walking this way, this is the route most likely he's going to take. I have not looked at the map of Jericho at that time to see whether there was only one road or one main street, but certainly Zacchaeus identified the direction that Jesus was going and he ran ahead of Jesus and went and positioned himself. So we need to be visionary in the things that we do. We need to know where the Lord is going. There are many of us that are moving in the opposite direction from the Lord. There are many people that are moving in a direction that the Lord has not told you to move. And let me tell you, brethren, if you are moving in a direction where the Lord does not want you to go, the Lord will shift you. The Lord will shift you. There are many ways through which the Lord will shift your direction. It could be a job loss. The Lord will shift you. The Lord says, I want you to go this way, but you are going this way. It could be a sickness. It could be an illness. It could be something that, that impairs you. It could be something that stops you. It could be something that interrupts your move. It may be just the objectives. Paul was on his way going to arrest brethren and Christians to persecute them. The Bible says he was breathing threats and murder. And the Lord met him on the road and slowed him down. Sometimes the Lord will slow us down to make sure that we pick the direction that the Lord is leading us. And my prayer and my advice is that as we pray, pray that the Lord leads you in the direction where the Lord wants you to go. Recently, I was speaking to somebody who has been writing applications, applications for jobs. And she has been writing applications for jobs. And one time she got to a stage and said, Lord, I am done writing applications. And she has been looking for employment for years, for time, for months, maybe not years, but months. 
and nobody was calling her back. Nobody was saying anything to her. And she went into a time of prayer and fasting and just humbling herself before the Lord. And she said, Lord, I'm not going to apply for application. I'm not going to send out any more applications. If, if you have a job for me out there, Lord, somebody is going to call me. And she called me excited and said, guess what? They've called me and offered me a job and I'm going to work. That's the God whom we serve. If you align yourself with his direction, the Lord will meet you and walk there with you. Zacchaeus picked the right spot. It is very important to pick the right spot. Even in ministry, even in the church, it is very important for you to pick the right spot. Have you picked your right spot to serve the Lord? Maybe you're struggling in the choir and you're not supposed to be in the choir. Maybe you're supposed to be an intercessor. Maybe you're supposed to be an usher. Maybe actually you're supposed to be an evangelist. But you've picked a spot and you've picked a spot and you think this is where the Lord wants me to be. But that's not where, that's not the spot where you're going to meet the Lord. Zacchaeus picked the right spot. It's my prayer that each one of us will pick the right spot, whether it's in the family, whether it's in business. You may be in a business where you are making losses. You may be in a business where you are struggling. You may be in a business where things are not adding up. You may be living in a place where you are not doing well. The other day, they told me of a very senior pastor. I will not say his name on, 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 on TV. But he went to buy a plot of land where he wanted to build his home, where he was going to retire. And when he asked around and said, whose house is that and who is there, the person who was going to be his neighbor is one of the chief witch doctors in the area. <laughs> and the pastor said, I don't want to spend all my life casting out demons and fighting evil spirits. I'm not going to buy this land, even though it is cheap. And he moved on to another place. Now, of course, you're going to tell me and say, he was a coward. He should have stayed there and, and, and called fire and fought the devil. But you need to pick your enemies. You need to pick you, your battles. You, you don't need to fight every battle in the world. You need to pick the right spot. Pick the spot where you're going to serve the Lord from. The Bible says he ran ahead. Let us learn to run ahead. Let us learn to run ahead. My question is, how are you running ahead? What are you doing to run ahead? Because as I've read the Bible, it interests me. I was reading about the Sunamite woman whose two children were going to be sold to pay back the debts that the prophet had left in the book of uh, 2 Kings chapter 4, I think it is. And when she went to the man of God, the question that the man of God asked her was, what do you have in your house? We need to run ahead and begin to have something that we can use in our service for the Lord. Is it savings? You need to run ahead and have some savings, some money that will keep you. Should you lose your job, how will you keep your family? How will you pay your bills? How will you pay your mortgage or your, your rent? You need to run ahead. You need to run ahead and begin. If, it is, if you are out of employment, you need to run ahead. This is the time to go and probably start doing a, a, another degree, a master's, a PhD. Or if you don't have a degree, this is the time to go and do a degree. Or learn a new skill. If you are not a computer person, go and learn a new skill. I am busy learning how to build a website or websites. Learn some new skills. Do something new. It's never too late for you to do anything. Yesterday, I was watching on television here in the United States of America, a woman, 107 years old. She survived the plague in 1918, and she got COVID, and she has survived the COVID 107 years, and they were interviewing her. And at 102 years, that's about five years ago, she wrote a book and published at 102 years. She wrote a book and published. Run ahead. Keep ahead of the pack. 
keep ahead of, 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 of the crowd? How do you run ahead? How do you run ahead of the crowd? How do you anticipate the economy? Yesterday I was speaking to somebody who was telling me about a business. Again, I will not disclose him here, but he was telling me about a business. He wants to start exporting things. And he said, you know what? This is the business that I'm thinking about. I have done my homework, but I'm still doing more homework. But I think this is a business that is going to, 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 to pay us as soon as markets open. And I said, wow, learn to run ahead. The sycamore fig tree was a despised source of livelihood. The tree that Zacchaeus climbed, if you read in the book of Amos chapter seven, verse 14, Amos the prophet was describing himself and he says, me, I'm a nobody. I am the son of a man. All he does is to produce sycamore figs. It was a despised way of life. It was a despised source of income. And I know this is the tree that Zacchaeus chose as his spot. Yes, you may be despised. Yes, you may be in a business that people despise. Yes, you may be in an employment that people despise. Yes, you may be doing things, something that is despised. Some people will look at what you are doing and they will laugh. But if you are convinced that that is where the Lord can meet you, if you are convinced that that is what the Lord wants you to do, keep doing it. Bishop has told us again and again, when he decided, when the Lord told him, go and start the church in Mukono, many people said, no, the place to start a church is Kampala. And he said, no, it will be Mukono. And oh my goodness, how many blessings have continued to come to Mukono because Bishop obeyed that voice and went to Mukono instead of Kampala. While the tree provided advantage for Zacchaeus, however, to see Jesus, I think Zacchaeus also had other advantages that he saw in the tree. He saw that he could be in the tree and see Jesus. I looked at the, 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 the sycamore fig tree and, and I saw it is leaf it has many leaves and it has big stems and the fruits are on the stem and so uh, Zacchaeus the short man my assumption is he must have thought this will be a good tree to provide me cover away from Jesus and from the people since he was hated I don't think he wanted anybody to see him and I don't think he wanted anybody to know that he was up there no so he had to pick a tree where he can hide and nobody will see him and nobody will know him and nobody will even realize that he is there. All he wanted is to see who Jesus was. But then you realize when Jesus came to the spot which Zacchaeus had picked, the Bible says he stopped. The first thing Jesus did was to stop. Let me tell you, brethren who are listening to me, if you are on the way that the Lord wants you to be, if you are in the place where the Lord wants you to be, the Lord will stop on your behalf. The Lord is going to stop. Tonight, the Lord is stopping at somebody's home. Tonight, the Lord is stopping in somebody's bedroom. Tonight, the Lord is stopping in somebody's business. May the Lord stop because of what you're doing. May the Lord stop because of where you are. May the Lord stop on your behalf. The Bible says when the Lord came to where Zacchaeus was, he stopped. May the Lord stop when you are in the right place. And if you're not in the right place, may you go to the right place and may the Lord stop there on your behalf. Maybe there are things you need to stop doing so that the Lord can stop on your behalf. But the Lord did not just stop. When he stopped, he looked up. Ah, hallelujah. May the Lord look up at you. May the Lord look on you. May the Lord look upon you. May the Lord look at you. May the Lord recognize you. He looked up. He recognized him. May the Lord recognize your efforts. May the Lord recognize your work and your labor. May the Lord recognize whatever you are doing. May the Lord be moved to look at you, to look at your family, to look at your pain, to look at your tears, to look at your prayers, to look at your crying and your fasting and your, your waking and staying awake when everybody else is sleeping and enjoying. May the Lord look at your giving. Not only did he stop and look up, the Bible says he spoke to him. May the Lord speak to you. 
May the Lord speak to you tonight. May the Lord speak to you this month. May the Lord speak to you this year. May the Lord speak to you. May the Lord speak to you from his word. May the Lord speak to you in your sleep when you sleep through dreams. May the Lord speak to you. But for the Lord to speak to you, you need to identify a spot from where God speaks to you. God does not speak to people from everywhere. I have noticed that the people to whom God speaks, they will have a place where God speaks to them. It could be by your bed. It could be in a special room in your house. It could be behind a special spot where when you go to pray, that is the quiet place where the Lord meets you. That's where the Lord speaks to you. Jesus Christ went, went up on the mountain. We don't all have to look for a mountain to climb the mountain for the Lord to hear us. The mountain could be right in your house. The mountain could be a chair in your house. The mountain could be a mat in your house on which you kneel to pray. The mountain could be a corner of your house where you lift your hands. The mountain could be an hour of the day of the night where you pick to lift your voice to the Lord and cry to him. But also notice that while you think you are seeking the Lord, the Lord is actually looking for you. In verse 10, the Lord Jesus Christ said, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. While you may think you are the one looking for the Lord, I am here to say to you tonight, the Lord is actually looking for you. And the Lord is looking for you. The Lord, the Lord is looking for people. The Bible says the Lord is looking for harvesters to go and harvest, for the harvest is ready and plentiful. In spite of what the world thinks about you and what you think about yourself, the Lord sees you only from his perspective. In verse 9, the Bible does not say when Jesus gets to Zacchaeus, he does not say, you sinner, come down. He does not say to him, you cheat, come down. He does not say to him, you tax collector, come down. When Jesus went to the house of Zacchaeus, other people saw a tax collector. Other people saw a sinner. Other people saw a cheat, a thief, a traitor. Jesus saw a son of Abraham. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what people see. It doesn't matter what people call you. It doesn't matter what people think you are. Maybe people think you are a prostitute, a harlot. Maybe people think you are a failure. Maybe people think you are unable to do anything. You are the person for whom nothing ever stays. I'm here to say to you tonight, it doesn't matter what people think and say. The only thing that counts is what the Lord sees in you. For Zacchaeus, the Lord did not see a sinner. The Lord saw a son of Abraham. And then I went on and I looked. The Lord knows you by name. Look at verse 5. When Jesus gets there, he does not say, hey, you short man, calm down. He doesn't say, you son of Abraham, calm down. He says, Zacchaeus, calm down. The Bible tells us that Lord knows the stars, every star. In Psalms 147 verse 4, every star has a name and the Lord knows all of them by name. He calls those stars by name. And if he knows the names of the stars and calls them by name, the Lord knows your name. The Lord knows my name. Praise the name of the living God. The Lord knows you by name. Your name is inscribed in the palm of his hands. The Lord knows you by name. May the Lord call you by name tonight. May the Lord call you by name in whatever you are doing. May the Lord answer you by name when you call. May the Lord answer you by name. Your name is known by the Lord. And when the Lord gets there, he says to him, come down immediately. Come down immediately. Brethren, come down immediately. Some of us have raised ourselves too high for the Lord to use us. I know people who have raised themselves too high. We have raised ourselves with titles, with jobs. I am Dr. Poso Mabawanya, who pastor, reverend, I'm evangelist, I'm this, I'm that. We've raised ourselves too high sometimes for the Lord to use us. We've raised ourselves. We've desired to be 
so high up in society that maybe the Lord cannot use us when we are still there. And he's saying to you, come down. Come down. Humility needs to come back into the hearts of the believers. Come down. The Lord will use you, but come down. And don't wait until something happens for you to come down. He says, come down immediately. We need to come down. May the Lord help you to come down from wherever you have lifted yourself up. Maybe you have lifted yourself in too much sorrow, too much fear, too much pain, too much anguish, too much crying. And for you all the time, every time they talk, you just think of those problems. And are, no, calm down. I know people who sometimes will not even listen to a preacher because they think he has nothing to offer me. Calm down. <laughs> calm down. And the Lord will speak to you and the Lord will use you. And he says immediately, when you look, read in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 8, 1 Samuel 21, verse 8, the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 8, the things of God require haste. The things of the king require some hurrying. They require haste. Do not wait. Do not tarry. Do not delay. If the Lord is telling you to do something, do it. Do it immediately. Don't wait. Don't keep waiting. Don't keep postponing. They say procrastination is the thief of time. And for most leaders, the one thing that makes them unsuccessful is procrastination. And while you are still procrastinating, the Lord is calling you. You are saying, I will go and you don't go. The Lord will find somebody else to send. And somebody else will go and do what the Lord wants them to do. And they will get the blessing. The Bible says he came down at once and welcomed Jesus gladly. With joy. My dear brethren, if you are listening to me tonight, today, this afternoon, this morning, wherever you are, we need to do the things of God with joy. I love what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3. Isaiah 12, verse 3. The Bible says, With joy shall I draw from the wells of salvation. We need to draw from the wells of salvation with joy. Brethren, salvation is not a punishment. Salvation is not a weight. It is not a load. It's not a cross. Salvation is a, is a joy, it's a relationship we are supposed to enjoy with our Father. Salvation is being in the presence of the Father. But there are so many people who are in salvation and salvation is becoming too heavy for them. Or they are walking in salvation like they are carrying the heaviest thing in their life. Salvation is a relationship with the Father. Where you go to the Father and say, Father, I am hurting here. Father, I need help here. Father, this is breaking me down. Father, I don't understand this. Father, this one is defeating me. And the Lord will embrace you with open arms and support you. Yesterday, I was talking to a man here in the United States of America who gave his life to Christ. And for three years, he was smoking and he knew he was smoking. He didn't have to be smoking. And he's a Christian. He's a believer. And 200 times he tried to quit. But he would quit today and tomorrow he's smoking. Until one day he knelt on his knees and said, Lord, this is too much for me. I give up. I am done. I can't do this on my own. Come and do it for me. And that was the last time he smoked. It's now nearly 20 years. He has never touched a cigarette. And every time he sees anybody smoking, he says, how can anybody be smoking? It smells so awful to him. Because he handed it over to the Lord. And the Lord filled his life with joy. Joy is your inheritance. Joy is your portion. The Lord wants you to have joy. Salvation is for you to have joy. Come to the Lord and enjoy the joy in salvation. King David said, create in me a new, a new heart, O Lord. Give me back, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. If you have lost your joy of salvation, call upon the Lord and say, Father, give me back that joy 
which made me enjoy. When they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord, that which made me say, oh, yes. That which when they said you are going to share the gospel, that when they said we are going out preaching, when they said we are going to pray, that which made you leap with joy, may God give you back that joy of your salvation. May God restore unto you that joy of salvation that you may enjoy your salvation. You're not supposed to be carrying a burden, a weight, struggling. And if you're struggling, find somebody and share with them and tell them and say, brother, sister, I'm struggling. Let them pray with you and the joy will restore unto you the joy of your salvation. Sometimes it is sin that is clogging your life, your arteries, and all you need to do is go to God and say, Lord, forgive me here, and the Lord will take over and the joy of salvation will come. Let me tell you, when you are walking with the Lord, even when you are in pain, even when you are in problems, you will not be focusing on that pain and those problems. You will be focusing on the Lord. Even when you don't have, you will know the Lord cannot let me go hungry. He has promised never to forsake me, never to abandon me. You will have confidence in the Lord because you are rested in him. May the Lord grant you his, the rest in him. We can go back to Zacchaeus as I bring this to a close. While you may just be looking for the spectacular, Zacchaeus was looking just to see who this Jesus is. Many people are looking for the spectacular. They want to see a miracle. They want to see the Lord come from heaven and do something which makes everybody marvel and shudder. And then they say, yes, I'm a man of God. I'm a woman of God. You see, the Lord has used me. While you may be looking for the spectacular, the Lord is not looking for the spectacular. The Lord is looking for a relationship. If you look at verse 5, the Lord says in uh, 19, 5, look, he says, tonight I must stay in your home. Zacchaeus was looking to see something spectacular. The Lord was looking for a relationship. Me, I want to come and live in your home. Let me tell you tonight, my brother, my sister, the Lord is looking for a relationship with you. The Lord wants you to invite him into your house. If you are listening to me and you are not saved and you are not born again, the Lord wants to build a relationship with you. If you are saved and you are born again, the Lord wants to build a relationship with you. The Lord wants to come and build a relationship. It is not about spectacular things. It is about a relationship. I must stay at your house. And the Bible says today, not tomorrow. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, the Bible says today is the day, the acceptable day of salvation. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15, he says today when you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 7, he says there is a day called today, the day when you enter the rest of the Lord. May today be the day that you enter the rest of the Lord. May today be your day of rest in the Lord. May today be the day when the Lord comes to your house, to sit in your house, even though people have despised you, even though people have rejected you, even though people have given up on you. Everybody thinks, no, you have no hope. That one is a no-hope zone. Nobody thinks anything good can come out of you. Nobody thinks anything good can come out of you. Eh, they think even the Lord will pass you by. Oh, ho. Oh. May the Lord stop on your behalf and grant you peace and joy in your house. Verse 7 is very interesting. The Bible says all the people saw this and they marveled. Let me tell you, my brother, my sister. The Bible says God rewards in public. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6 in the Aramaic English Bible. The Aramaic English Bible, Matthew 6, 6 says, God rewards in the public. May God reward you in public. So much so that people will see what the Lord has done for you. And everybody will glorify God. The Bible says, let people see your good works. People will see what you do. But people will see also the good things God has done for you. And they will glorify your God. They will come running. They will marvel. The Bible says they all saw this and they marveled. They will see it. May they see it. What the people think and say did not matter. 
It is what the Lord sees and says that matters. Let me read that verse 7 again as I bring this to a close. I love that. Verse 5 and 7. The Bible says, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to the guest of a sinner. People saw a sinner, but Jesus does not see a sinner. He sees a child of God. May God see you the way he wants to see you. When salvation came in verse 9, salvation entered. When salvation entered the house, hallelujah. Number one, you are called to stand up for Jesus. Salvation entered the house. The moment salvation entered the house, you see verse 8. But Zacchaeus stood up. When salvation enters your house, you will stand up for the Lord. You will stand. It doesn't matter in what circumstance. I know as a church, we have recently lost a dear brother. I am so glad. In my heart, I've been thinking and saying, Brother Tegu is a martyr. A part of me believes that Brother Tegu died for his faith. The people who killed him, they found him praying. When they say he was speaking things that they could not understand, he was speaking in tongues. He was praying. How do you attack a man who is praying? Did he have a, a knife? Did he have a sword? And they say he was a thief. What was he carrying? Had anybody complained that somebody, a thief, had broken into their house? No. Brother Tegu died the matter. He stood up for Jesus. He died praying. The Bible says, blessed is the man, the servant, whose master will find him doing what he left him to do. What has the Lord left you to do? We will all die one day. I've always told you, we will all one day die. Age is a number. When the Lord decides for you to die, you will die. I want to believe that the Lord allowed Brother Tegu to die. That was his time. If the Lord wanted to preserve Brother Tegu, Brother Tegu would not have died. Yes, we lost him. He was a young man. We all knew him. We loved him. His family had a lot of hope. We all had a lot of hope. He was a, a, a warrior in the, in, the, in the ministry. He was a laborer in the vineyard of the Lord. My heart cries because I empathize with the parents. I have ever lost a son. This is the thing that no parent should ever have to experience. And I know the pain the parents must be going through. But a part of me is very confident that brother, take good eye the matter, and he's with the Lord. I only hope that the government of Uganda will continue to bring justice for brother Tegu. We've had so many discordant, discordant stories. I just hope like Bishop said in that press conference that brother Tegu will get justice. But let me say to you, brethren, when salvation entered the house of Zacchaeus, the Bible says he repented. Salvation brings three things. Number one, repentance. Number two, transformation. Number three, restitution. He repented. He got transformed. And he decided he was going to pay back. Salvation brings repentance transformation, and restitution. Verse 8, his values changed. As a Christian, your values must change. He gave up half of his possessions. And if he had cheated anybody, he was going to pay back four times. This man's values changed. If you came into salvation and your values have not changed, you need to check the salvation you embraced. Salvation changes values. Salvation changes perspectives, changes the way you look at things, changes the glasses through which you look at things. 
If you look at things with glasses that are tinted red, you will see things looking red. Salvation transforms lives. When you become a Christian, when salvation comes into your house, you become a giver. You become a giver. Zacchaeus immediately changed from wanting to grab and get richer to becoming one who says, oh, I'm going to give out my goods to the poor. Salvation must open your hands to be a giver as a believer. And giving does not only mean bringing to the church. There are many ways of giving. There's nothing wrong with bringing to the church. The Bible says bring a tithe to the house of the Lord that there may be food. But also give to the poor. And I read a very interesting verse in Luke chapter 16, verse 15. Let me read it. Luke 16, 15. I've been studying the book of Luke, which is why I'm speaking from the book of Luke. 16, 15 says, he said to them, you are the sons who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. What you value is detestable in God's sight. You need to be a giver. And he says, when you give to the poor, your lives will be sanctified right there. Giving cleanses you. Look at Luke 11 verse 41. Luke 11 verse 41. Giving cleanses you. Giving makes you righteous. Listen to me here. The Bible says, Luke eleven forty one. He says, but now as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. <laughs> be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. That blew me away. By giving to those who are in need, by giving to those who are poor, everything will become clean for you. Your situation turns around from being a villain to becoming a saint. When salvation enters your house, you move from being a villain to becoming a saint. In summary, here are 12 lessons I want you to go away with. From lessons from Zacchaeus. Receive Jesus by seeking after him with all your heart, all your mind and body. Number two, humble yourself. Number three, receive Jesus no matter how sinful or hated you are. Your situation doesn't matter. Your circumstances don't matter. It doesn't matter how far you've fallen and what you've done. Embrace Jesus. Jesus is ready to come and live in your house. Number four, Jesus invites you by name because you are precious to him. Come as you are. Number five, receive him without delay. Number six, come down to him and come immediately. Number seven, focus on Jesus, not on the things that Jesus gives or the things that Jesus does. Focus on Jesus himself. Number eight, take him into your life and take him into your home and take him with joy. Number nine, receive him joyfully. Number 10, it does not matter what others say. Stop worrying yourself by what people will say or people think. Perform for the audience of one, the audience of God. What should bother you? What should worry you? What should make you worried and anxious is what will God say? Verse 11, bear fruits of repentance, transformation, and restitution. And finally, verse 12, become a blessing to others. Zacchaeus became a blessing to others when salvation came into his house. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you very much for the time you've given us to be together. And thank you for all the word that we have broken together. Dear Holy Spirit, it is my prayer that this word will be multiplied in everybody's heart and that the Holy Spirit will continue to expound on it and teach everybody the multiplicity of lessons that are in this word, and that this word will continue to touch lives and transform many. And that like Zacchaeus was transformed and blessed and he became a blessing, that the hearers and the people who listen to this word 
will be transformed and will be a blessing to others. And that they themselves will be blessed. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we do pray. Amen. May God bless you. Thank you very much for listening and for tuning in. And may God bless you and may God guide you. In Jesus' name, amen.